order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And we will start with listed questions. I call Mr Cathal Boyle. Mr Boyle. Kesh Deverhain, let a halt question number one, please. Well, thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, I've been advised that there's no legal definition of what actually constitutes an essential as opposed to emergency service. However, the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service is the emergency service of Northern Ireland's health and social care, and as such is considered an emergency service alongside with police and the fire service. While the police and fire service are standalone services, our ambulance services is an integral part of the HSC, and I strongly believe that it should remain so. NIAS is more than just an emergency service. It provides essential clinical services and plays an important role in the wider urgent and emergency care system. Call Mr. Boylan for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I could have thanked the Minister for his answer, but could I ask the Minister would he consider uh, re evaluating the classification to bring it into line with, with the service? Uh, uh, w provided an excellent service um, at the Odyssey. Uh, they dealt with a lot of people uh, at site without bringing them to hospital. We were able to provide them uh, the support and care that they needed. And indeed, they uh, initiated uh, a major incident, and that was something that was absolutely necessary and the right thing to do, um, given the scale of, of, of the event that was occurring and the possibility that it could have got considerably worse. Uh, and they ensured that the, the hospitals were well prepared and well placed. Uh, to deal with the, with the numbers that did come in, but were greatly assisted um, by the ambulance service uh, through the, their work on the ground and ensuring that large numbers were actually dealt with uh, without having to come to hospital. So I, I couldn't commend the ambulance service highly enough um, for their response in that instance. Well, Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister following through from the original question in relation to the new car style ambulances that are seen across Northern Ireland? Are they compliant and, and with emergency vehicles in terms of their specification? Well, what happens with, with, with the cars is that they can get to the, the site quicker. Um, so you have a paramedic uh, who can get to the, the individuals quicker. And uh, over 70 per cent of people in Northern Ireland um, are responded to by the Northern Ireland Ambulance Service within eight minutes of making that call, which is, which is quite remarkable, um, given the, the geography of Northern Ireland. A lot of that is actually done in the cars. Um, so you'll have a paramedic there who will be uh, very often getting all of the uh, equipment and testing equipment and so forth and, and doing the first response. And if people need to be taken to hospital, the, the ambulances are very often um, quickly on the scene as well. So it is, enables us to, to, as first responders, engage even more quickly um, to the needs of people. Call Mr. Robin Newton for a question. Uh, question number two, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Partnership working is vital if we are to effectively promote better health and tackle health inequalities. This includes working with communities who are best placed to know their local resources, assets, issues and challenges. This intimate knowledge is vital in tailoring services and initiatives to address local needs and in finding solutions to these challenges. The Public Health Agency is working at a strategic city-wide level with Belfast City Council and other organisations through Belfast Strategic Partnership to coordinate actions for health improvement across the city. Members of local community organisations and area-based partnerships are key members of this partnership. In addition, say, in addition, the agency is supporting actions at a more local community level through investment of some £6 million, largely channelled through the community and voluntary sector. One example is East Belfast Health Framework, I launched recently. This will provide community-driven frontline action and practical support for those individuals in need, of, in need in their families. Call Mr. Newton for supplementary. I thank the minister for his uh, re 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 comments so far. I wonder, and he has mentioned the strategy that he, he announced. I wonder, could the minister be specific about the issues that he is uh, addressing in the east of the city? Well, the Public Health Agency fund five community-based posts in East Belfast Community Development Agency and East Belfast Partnership at a cost of almost £200,000 per annum. And work is being taken forward to ensure that the contracts that the PHA have 
are aligned with the five uh, themes of the East Belfast Health Framework, and an action plan will be developed uh, for 2014-15. During 2012-13, PHA funded work with East Belfast Independent Advice Centre, and this resulted in support for 236 people with mental health issues from disadvantaged areas to access benefits that they were entitled to, and the result of this um, produced an income of some 310,000 for those people. A number of organisations are being funded through Protect Life, and additional investment has been made recently to enhance bereavement support in the area. A local drugs and alcohol action plan for East Belfast was developed in November 2013. And it specifies a range of actions to be taken forward in 2013-14. Call Mr. William Irwin for a question. Question number three, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Last October saw the introduction of the first phase of the children's flu vaccination programme across Northern Ireland, with a live attenuated influenza vaccine, uh, flu, flu ends, which has been shown to provide greater protection for children than an activated influenza vaccine being offered to all children aged two or three years old and pupils in primary year six. This vaccine was also offered to the children in an at-risk group aged two years to less than 18 years of age. Provisional data covering the period up to the end of December shows that Northern Ireland has achieved the best uptake rates across the UK, which for two and three-year-olds was 54.3 per cent and for children in P6 was 80.7 per cent. I would like to express my appreciation to all who have worked hard to achieve these uptake rates. I recognise the considerable effort required by GPs and school nursing teams to complete the seasonal flu vaccination programme within a very short timescale. And from this incoming autumn, in addition to the routine flu programme, the children's flu vaccination programme will be extended to all preschool children aged two or more and all primary school children. In the autumn of 2015, it is intended to extend the flu vaccination programme to include secondary school aged children. Mr. Irwin for supplementary. Thank you, and can I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, how important does the Minister feel uh, that flu and vaccination uh, is uh, to young people? Well, flu vaccination for us is a very important uh, policy, and, and we believe that we can avoid people uh, attending our emergency departments and indeed uh, being admitted to hospital as a consequence um, of the more serious symptoms of flu. Uh, in relation to the flu vaccination programme, the, the provisional data covering the period up to the end of the December shows that Northern Ireland had achieved um, excellent uptake, rec- upt- uptake, uptake rates um, across the UK, uh, which are over 65, 72.6%, under 65, at risk, 72.3%, and pregnant women 51.4 per cent. And that is a demonstration that people in Northern Ireland are getting the message very clearly and taking it very seriously um, that flu can be a quite a serious illness and that they can do something to avoid it. And many people take that option. And we are keen that more and more children take that option and ensure that they don't suffer uh, the effects of flu. Ms. Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. In response to a recent question that I tabled to the Education Minister, it indicated that almost 15,000 work days were lost amongst the teaching profession last year as a result of flu-related illnesses. Would the Minister therefore consider working with the Education Minister to extend a flu vaccination programme to teachers? Yeah, it seems a perfectly reasonable uh, suggestion from the member, and something I would be very happy to talk to the Education Minister about. Um, obviously, we're, we're uh, targeting school children because flu is so common and so easily spread whenever you get into that environment. And certainly, uh, we want our teachers to be teaching, not sitting at home sick. And I'm sure they want to be teaching and not sitting at home sick. So, if that's something the education minister wishes to take up with me, I'd be very happy to uh, liaise with them on it. Mrs. Karen McKevitt. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the uh, Minister to outline uh, the stock levels of vaccinations and whether they are subject to um, sell by dates? Well, this year, Northern Ireland had 546,500 doses of seasonal flu vaccine procured. Um, so, stock levels have been uh, reasonably good um, for this year in, in terms of the target groups that we are going after, and that has not proven to be an issue for us. Mr. Fergal McKinney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number four. The Health and Social Care Board has responsibility for commissioning all cancer drugs available in Northern Ireland. 
Both the HSCB and the NHS commissioning bodies in England are guided by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence in determining what cancer drugs should be routinely available. All NICE-approved uh, cancer drugs that are routinely available in England are either recurrently funded or available via a cost per mechanism in Northern Ireland. The HSCB has a clear process by which unapproved cancer drugs can be made available to patients by means of an individual funding request, setting out the clinical circumstances which support that request. Mr McKinney for supplement. I thank the Minister. The Cancer Drugs Fund in England takes a different approach for non-routinely available drugs and has granted NHS access uh, to up to 38 drugs that are not available here. Would the Minister consider either a Cancer Drugs Fund model here or approaching his Westminster counterpart uh, to address this inequality? I certainly would consider it, and, and if the uh, Executive Assembly supported me in doing it, I would do it very, very quickly. And that would be through um, charging something for prescriptions once again, um, which would allow us to establish a specialist drugs fund, not just for cancer drugs, but for, for specialist drugs which aren't regularly available. I, I think that it is the right thing to do. I think that any good socialist would want to do it because those of us who could afford to pay for drugs would ensure that people who really need them but can't afford them would have the opportunity to receive them, and we would save people's lives. But if people want to cling on to um, another policy, that is entirely a matter for them. Well, Mr Danny Kinnan. Thank you very much, um, Deputy Speaker. I may uh, thank the Minister for his answers so far. When it comes to the funding of those that need to go across the water, for special treatment for cancer or indeed for um, other illnesses. Would the Minister look at reviewing the process so that it is quicker, so that people can get the money, so they can get over for the treatment as quickly as possible? Well, in terms of that process, that's carried out through the Health and Social Care Board. If the member has uh, identified uh, particular issues and problems, if he wishes to raise it either directly with uh, the Chief Executive of the Board or indeed myself, we will, we will pursue that matter. Uh, if this is an issue which members in general um, have identified, then that is certainly something that I would be very happy to look at. Well, Mr George Robinson. Mr Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister what work is going on in relation to the managed entry of new drugs? Well, the Health and Social Care Board uh, is in the process of refining and further developing the current processes for managing entry of new medicines to ensure that they are more effective and more clearly understood by patients, their representatives and clinicians, and that guidance should be issued shortly. Access to effective treatments for the population of Northern Ireland, including access to cancer drugs and other specialist medicines, is an important priority for myself and indeed for the Department. And I am determined to explore every avenue available open to me to deliver increased access to specialist medicines and other interventions. I think it is one thing that the general public desire us to do if there has been a lot of research and work has went into developing uh, new, new procedures and new drugs, that they want Northern Ireland to be at the forefront of delivering upon that. Uh, I think that we are somewhat constrained in doing it, and I have suggested to the House today that we have a means of, of actually uh, getting around that. Uh, and I would seek that members would actually think very clearly about what we are uh, suggesting to them, uh, that there is a real possibility of making a difference to people's lives and saving many lives as a consequence. Call yeah. Mr Patsy McGlone for a question. Uh, Colonel Mayogad, I can ask John Corlea. Cash Dever de Cooey, question number five. A public consultation by the Health and Social Care Board on the future model for Tier 4 addiction services closed on the 24th of January 2014. The Board is now considering all responses received and is finalising proposals on appropriate model of service provision which will take account of the wider need of the overall Northern Ireland population and seek to improve outcomes for clients. The Board hopes to complete this work by the end of April 2014. Therefore, no decision has been taken at this stage on the future model or indeed the location of any service. Mr McGlone, for supplementary. Well, we have Lysianaira as an agriculture. I thank the Minister for his response on that. Uh, can the Minister give any assurances, therefore, in light of his answer, that uh, the addictions unit planned for the new local enhanced hospital in Oma will now be potentially jeopardised as a result of any proposed changes to addiction services which may be centralised across the region? Well, again, 
I am less interested in, in buildings and locations than I am in outcomes. And the course of work that we are looking at would uh, see many more people being treated in the community, uh, and therefore uh, the locations of, of, of the buildings are, are, are less of an issue for us. However, we are engaged in a consultation process, and we are drawing the feedback from that and collating that feedback to identify the way, the way forward. So we are not at a point of making decisions. Uh, members can lobby, members can, can, can seek to, to influence um, at this point, uh, but there is a course of work that needs to be carried out before we will arrive at a decision. Mr Barry Michael Duff. Can I thank the Minister for his answers to it as well, but my specific interest will be in the future of the ATU in OMA. Can I ask the Minister if he accepts that it isn't at all feasible, given the rurality of counties Tyrone and Fermanagh, to expect people to travel outside of those counties for addiction treatment services, and that really what is needed is a new configuration which maybe divides the north into three regions as opposed to two? Yep. The question is, does the Minister accept that it is not feasible for people living in rural areas in Tyrone and Fermanagh to travel beyond that region, that sub-region, to access these essential services? Well, it's certainly something that I, that I will pay attention to, um, perhaps unlike previous uh, ministers who, who decided that they didn't need a hospital in Oma and, and decided to close that. And uh, Mr McIlduff didn't seem to have that great of an influence. Um, with Minister De Bruyne, his own Sinn Féin minister, on that occasion, and didn't deliver, certainly for the people of Oma on that occasion. Thankfully, um, since the DUP came in, uh, a new hospital has been proposed and has started to be developed in uh, the town of Oma. And uh, we will certainly look at all, all of these things very seriously in seeking to ensure that Oma gets fair treatment under the DUP and the God under Sinn Féin. Call Mr Alban McGuinness. Uh, question number six, Deputy Speaker. Health and social care organisations are required to routinely report serious adverse incidents to the Health and Social Care Board. There are specific criteria that will determine whether or not an adverse incident constitutes an SAI. Any adverse incident which meets, more or one, meets one or more of the criteria should be reported as an SAI to the Health and Social Care Board within 72 hours of the incident being discovered. There have been five uh, there have been less than five serious adverse incident forms detailing incidents where patient safety has been compromised submitted by the staff in the emergency department or the acute medical ward at either the Royal Victoria Hospital or the Matter Hospital in the last 12 weeks. In line with departmental policy, information on specific numbers <coughs> is not routinely published if the number is less than five. This approach is taken in order to maintain patient confidentiality. for uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for that uh, answer. But given the uh, ongoing difficulties uh, in relation to the Royal Hospital in particular, the, uh, would the Minister not express some concern, indeed even surprise, that only five um, uh, serious incident uh, report forms have in fact been received? I, I said less than five, so it could be considerably less than that. I think that th this morning um, we all learnt, including myself, of uh, five serious adverse incidents that have been reported over the course of the last uh, 12 months, from December, <coughs> I think, I believe, from December uh, 2012 to November 2013. And uh, in that instance, uh, they have indicated uh, that. Uh, the medical response uh, could have been better if, had there been more doctors available. Uh, so those are serious questions that we all will be seeking answers to um, over the course of, of, of the, the period of time that, 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 uh, that lies ahead. Um, it will be difficult probably to reveal all of the answers uh, because we are de dealing with a relatively small number of people and there will be patient confidentiality issues that will arise. And there may be issues that will require the coroner to actually take a look at uh, to uh, identify and ensure uh, that uh, matters uh, were dealt with um, appropriately. Troy Beggs. 
Thank, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, extended waitings at, at our a and &E, we've learned, can contribute to uh, serious incidents at the, at the a and &E's. Would the Minister accept that the, with significant numbers of patients having to wait more than four hours, that there is a risk that their health could have deteriorated from when they were initially set, assessed by the triage nurse? And when will uh, Northern Ireland uh, uh, waiting times match those in the rest of the United Kingdom to reduce this risk? Well, <clears throat> certainly I think that the, the waiting times that we set are appropriate, and that's why I've rigidly stuck to those waiting times. And indeed, over the course <coughs> of the last uh, couple of months, we have had trade union representatives, for example, and, and I know that a lot of politicians here uh, like to run with the trade unions, but with the trade unions who are saying that they are not reasonable, that we should extend those waiting times. And I think the evidence that uh, we have seen over the course of the last few days would indicate that the waiting times are not unreasonable, that the waiting times are actually um, a reasonable expectation for us uh, to seek uh, of our hospitals. So, in the course of all of that, we have uh, sought to ensure that waiting times are reduced. Uh, I'm glad that waiting times, for example, uh, for the 12-hour waits have, have reduced by over a third, or by reduced to a third of what they were uh, in the previous year, uh, in December of 2013, for example. And so there is considerable work has been done on that. I think that we can do more, and that is why I made the statement that I made yesterday to ensure that we do adopt best practice wherever best practice is being applied and use the expertise uh, that has delivered that uh, to assist us in the delivery uh, of better waiting times in Northern Ireland. Well, Mr Leslie Cree for a question. Question 7, Deputy Speaker. The South Eastern Trust has made significant progress in reducing the number of patients uh, waiting longer than 12 hours in the Ulster Hospital's emergency department. In December 2013, 21 patients waited more than 12 hours, which is un unacceptable to me, but that was compared to 286 patients in December 2012. In December 2013, 70.7% of patients were treated and discharged home or admitted to a ward within four hours, compared to 68.8% in December 2012. I look to the Health and Social Care Board to continue working with the Trust to make further progress on meeting my targets for emergency care. Mr Cree for a supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank the Minister for his response. The Minister is aware of the pressures on the Ulster and, indeed, uh, on the Royal Victoria. We did touch yesterday on the question of Antrim. I was just wondering, Minister, bearing in mind the pressures on the Ulster Hospital, do you not consider it prudent to have a review in the Ulster Hospital? Well, certainly I think that if we do a course of work with the Royal Victoria Hospital, um, with that flowing from that, um, should we have very strong recommendations, we will want to be looking at the other emergency departments to ensure that they are operating as efficiently as they should be. So whether that would involve um, the full-scale reporting uh, that we are currently seeking in relation to the Royal or not remains to be seen. Uh, but certainly we will want to see that uh, our hospitals right across Northern Ireland um, are responding well. And certainly, if there are actions taken in the Royal which dramatically improve performance, uh, then we will want to see that dramatic improvement elsewhere. If that involves um, asking the team to do a course of work elsewhere, uh, then that is something we will give consideration to. Well, Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers today. Bearing in mind the significance of the Ulster Hospital within the South Eastern Trust, what measures has the Minister put in place in relation to ongoing winter pressures? Over the winter period, we have made an additional £600,000 available uh, to recruit extra staff and uh, to implement the initiatives to manage that extra activity. So we have created 10 extra medical beds in the Ulster Hospital site, uh, improved the patient flow and discharge of patients in the hospital. We are making a greater utilisation of Ards and Bangor community hospitals as medical step-down facilities. There are 10 additional intermediate care beds um, in an independent sector facility, additional care package provision including physiotherapy and social work support, additional pharmacy support at the weekends, a rapid response nursing service which will provide additional interventions such as IV antibiotics in clinic 
and domiciliary settings in the community, additional therapy provision to community rehabilitation team, additional allied health professionals and social work resources in Ards and Bangor Community Hospital. Well, Mr. Chris Hazard. I notice, uh, thank the Minister for his answer so far, but I also notice he never mentioned that he closed the down A&E at weekends and at evenings as well to, to help the Ulster. But the Minister will also be aware that 41 per cent of the, the, those seen at the Ulster Hospital are actually not from the southeastern area but from the Belfast Trust area. What sort of uh, pressure does this reflect on the Ulster Hospital? Thank you very much. Well, the, the member well knows, but he, he seeks to, to uh, cause some sort of deflection that I didn't close the down any at weekends. He knows that that was a trust decision. It was an operational decision that was based on safety because he didn't have the adequate number of doctors to provide the care and cover at the weekends. And that is a question we all need to ask ourselves. Why do we have such problems recruiting doctors to work in emergency departments? And I know that I've given the people the answers sometimes, and they don't like the answers. But that, nonetheless, that's where we are. In terms of the 41 per cent of people that attend the Ulster Hospital uh, who don't come from the South Eastern Trust, I think it's important to remember that a large number of the attendances at the Royal Victoria Hospital are people who are from the South Eastern Trust. So it's uh, a bit of swings and roundabouts. Uh, many people who live in the Collin area, for example, will not travel to the Ulster Hospital whenever it is much more accessible to travel to the Royal Victoria Hospital. And that is wholly understandable. Many people in the Lisburn area will travel to the Royal Victoria Hospital before they'll travel to the Ulster Hospital. And indeed, many ambulances will take people to the Royal Victoria first because they're not going to drive past an acute hospital with a seriously ill person um, if the hospital is available to them. So uh, it, it isn't a case of the, the South Eastern Trust um, having to absorb a lot of people from Belfast um, and Belfast not absorbing anybody from the South Eastern Trust. That, that clearly isn't the case. Well, Mr. Phil Flanagan for a question. Mr. Mayor, the last Kinkorley case, David Hart, question number eight. There is a nine-week access standard for all allied health professionals, including occupational therapy. This waiting time has improved progressively, moving from 26 weeks uh, a few years ago to 13 weeks and then to the current nine-week target. Improved waiting times for occupational therapy service is a priority for my department, the Health and Social Care Board and the Public Health Agency. In 2013-14, the Health and Social Care Board allocated an additional 165,000 non-recurrently to support the Western Health and Social Care Trust to reduce occupational therapy waiting times. Despite this additional funding, waiting times have increased during 2013-14. The Health and Social Care Board and Public Health Agency are currently working closely with the Western Trust to address the issue. Work is ongoing to establish the level of demand for occupational therapy services and the capacity necessary to meet such demand in line with my challenging nine-week access standard. I'm sorry, there isn't time for a supplementary. But we've got to move on. Uh, that, in fact, ends the period of oral questions. Uh, we will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Cahill Washeen. Mr. Washeen. Uh, with the last count, Korda, could I ask the Minister how he will respond to the shocking news of the death of five patients in the Royal due to the uh, delays of waiting times? Well, certainly I had already uh, initiated. Um, reporting procedures to, to happen prior to being aware of, of um, the five uh, people who died. I should make clear that the five people who died died because they were seriously unwell and attended the Royal Victoria Hospital. Uh, there is a serious adverse incident report that was compiled uh, and that uh, will identify that there is a possibility that more could have been done and there is a possibility that maybe not all five people would have died. But we don't know that, and we haven't got um, the evidence to, to, to either say that um, or actually to uh, indicate that that's not the case at this stage. Um, but there is always a number of deaths in emergency departments. It's a challenge for all health services and the avoidance of preventable deaths. And the speed of what, what appropriate medical care can be delivered is a factor. That includes ambulance response times, triage, diagnostic testing, and the provision of clinical care. They are all essential in ensuring the best outcome for the individual. Uh, I did express previously my concern about the Royal uh, Victoria Hospital. 
I am aware of the five cases that have been referred to by Mr Ocean. And, uh, while I do not have the specific details, I have asked my officials to ascertain whether the systems in place for learning are fully functional and to identify issues of concern. It is important to reassure the public about the overall safety of these services. We know that overall mortality figures for Northern Ireland hospitals, including the Belfast Trust, compare favourably with the rest of the UK. In fact, the average in England in terms of mortality is higher than, the, than we have in any of our trusts across Northern Ireland. So let's be very clear about that. The public need to know that mortality is lower in Northern Ireland than it is in England in our hospitals. The serious adverse incident is a learning system, and it is important to note that not every case referred to as an SAI indicates that there has been any problem with the care provided or the patient or client. For example, there are certain categories of death that must automatically be reported as an SAI, if, and members will understand. Order. I presume the minister has asked for extra time. I haven't. No. <laughs> are you asking for it? Well, if, if, if I can have just, uh, just half, half a minute, Mr. Speaker, to appreciate that. Members will understand that great care needs to be taken in discussing these individual cases and clients in order to protect their confidentiality. But I want to assure members that I have sought the assurance from officials that all appropriate steps uh, and processes were taken. It would be wrong to conclude at this stage that the outcome in these cases were directly related to waiting times. And whilst we recognise health care can never be 100 per cent safe, that these were very sick patients, they were very complex cases, um, so these patients uh, may have passed away uh, in, in any case. Uh, I think it would also be appropriate um, for this House to express its sympathies um, to the, the, the five people's families um, uh, at these deaths. Well, Mr. Washington, for supplementary. Uh, the, last can occur, and the Minister concedes there is a possibility that more could be done. Will the Minister now actually apologise to those families and what can he do to actually instil public confidence? Well, I certainly would express my sympathies to, to the families and have expressed my sympathies um, in these circumstances. I think that um, for every individual, their case is the most important case, and we must never get away um, from the fact that health care is about serving the needs um, of individuals. And I think that we do need to um, further look into these cases uh, and identify uh, if failings on the part of, of, of the health and social care um, were a factor in those deaths. That needs to be identified, and it needs to be avoided. Uh, in other instances. Call Mr. Fergal McKinney for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I too would like to extend our sincere sympathies to the families of those who learned today that uh, uh, they may have died as a result of accident and emergency pressures uh, at the Royal Victoria Hospital. Perhaps could I come at this from a different angle? And would the Minister care to contrast that sad news with his comments in early January that the pressure situa situation at the Royal was a one off? Well, I, I think that the discussion that we had in January was about three days, and uh, this particular uh, issue that we're discussing is about five incidents over the course of a year. So we need to be very careful, and we need to be very sensitive how we handle these things. And uh, I don't intend to engage in, in, in some sort of ping pong about people's deaths. Well, Mr. McKinney, for supplementary. And can I assure the House that neither will I, but it is our view that uh, it was sustained political and media focus that has led to these revelations, which might not otherwise have come to the fore. And we conclude that either the Minister did not know or did know about the longer term pressures when he was making his earlier remarks. And would he therefore agree with me that the public might be right to suspect that there was at least a disguising of the situation or, at worst, a cover up? Well, I think that, and you know, it's been said in this house quite a number of times, and people can ignore it, um, but it's factual. I attended the Royal Victoria Hospital uh, on the morning after uh, the major incident was declared, and I spoke to staff, and I took my actions on the basis of speaking to staff. Nothing else, nothing more, or nothing less. <coughs> Call Mr. Pat Ramsey for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. And I want to ask the Minister on a very, another very emotive and sensitive subject matter. Andrew Quigley, a young man from Derry, has been missing for four weeks now. 
uh, where he went down to the River Foyle from one of the bridges. Colette and his family clearly are heartbroken and devastated. And we have emergency service both north and south of the border, along with Fort Search and Rescue trying to locate uh, Andrew. Could the Minister outline to the House any discussions he has had with DRD, irresponsible for the bridges, or public health agency in respect of their role of bringing forward deterrents that might act to prevent young people trying to cause self-harm? Uh, my, my officials uh, certainly have engaged with DRD officials in terms of making the bridges more safe. Um, I, I don't suppose that if someone is determined to take their own life, uh, it's, it's possible to always have a, a means of stopping them doing that. But I certainly think that there are people who may be thinking about it, and if there are adequate deterrents in place, um, it may well stop them. And, and I know that there is learning that we can take from other places, for example, San Francisco and, and the Golden Gate Bridge and so forth. Uh, so I would be very, very keen that my department officials will continue to engage with people um, in the Foyle constituency, um, with the RD and, and others, uh, and recognise the, the huge distress that it causes to, to the family that, that uh, Mr Ramsey has, has uh, referred to today. And again, uh, I would support him in, in the sympathies that he's expressed for that family. Call Mr. Ramsey for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and certainly the Minister's comments. I will certainly pass them on to, to, to the family. Would the Minister be mindful then, given his own comments, that he would convene along with DRD a multi agency approach? Foil Search and Rescue is one of the main bodies who act to try and prevent lives. I've absolutely said that small structural changes could act as a deterrent at that moment in time to prevent someone either jumping on or trying to jump on. I can assure the, the member that I will uh, make officials available, um, and if he was wished to convene a meeting um, in, in, in the FOIL area, uh, that health um, healthcare officials will not be found wanting in terms of seeking to respond to the issues uh, that he has raised. Call Mr. Peter Weir for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the minister how have the numbers of key staff working in our local health service changed since 2011? The most recent figures for <coughs> whole time equivalents in September compared with March uh, 2011. The number of consultants, um, both medical and dental, are up by 160, or 12 per cent. The number of middle grade doctors is up by 69, or 20 per cent. Nurses and midwives are up by 531, 4 per cent. Nursing support staff is up by 147, 4 per cent. Paramedics and ambulance staff are up by 12, 2%, and qualified allied health professionals are up by 317, uh, 11%. Do we have your supplementary? Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister has indicated that across the board, in a range of uh, functions, that the staff numbers are up within the health service. Uh, what factors has he identified that mean that our trusts uh, are still finding it challenging to provide services in a timely manner? I think that uh, there are certain areas where it is harder to attract staff. Um, so surgery, emergency medicine, uh, OBS and gynae are, are, are all areas uh, where we're finding it more difficult to, to recruit staff, and that's, that needs to be made very clear. We also have particular issues and particular problems, uh, for example, in the Western Trust, uh, where it is more difficult uh, to attract doctors than perhaps in the Greater Belfast area, and the smaller regional hospitals very often will struggle um, to attract staff, um, as is the case, for example, in Lagan Valley and Down, and perhaps to a lesser extent Causeway, which means that we become more reliant on locum doctors. But I think from the figures that I have quoted, people can see that in spite of the financial pressures that have existed over the course of the last uh, number of years, that we have continued to drive up the numbers who are providing the frontline services uh, to better equip um, the health and social care sector to respond uh, to the obvious needs of the public. I call Mr. Chris Hazard for a question. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, does he agree with the South Eastern Trust, who believe that their preferred option for the Down Hospital is a minor injuries unit, or is he committed to the full restoration of 24 hours a and &E at Downpatrick? Well, I think uh, in terms of what I have instructed the South Eastern Trust to um, make uh, greater efforts to recruit uh, emergency uh, doctors, 
and emergency doctors will be able to provide a, a more extensive service. Uh, in the meantime, I have asked the South Eastern Trust um, to produce a plan which will provide support for the people um, in the Down area and indeed the Lagan Valley area. And they have produced a plan which has been submitted to the Health and Social Care Board, uh, which will ensure that the vast majority of needs in the, the Down hospital area will be met in that facility um, whilst uh, they continue to seek to recruit emergency doctors. Mr Hansard for supplementary. And I thank the Minister for his answer to date. Uh, another issue connected to this uh, is people have no faith in the governance of the South Eastern Trust in the area. Does the Minister have any plans to look at the governance structures of the South Eastern Trust and to, to see if they are fit for purpose going forward? Well, we, we all have a role, um, particularly myself, in, in holding the South Eastern Trust to account. Uh, but this, this House has a role, um, as indeed um, do local authorities have a role. And uh, it is important that trusts do respond uh, to the needs of local communities. Uh, the first element of, of the provision of health and social care will be safety and quality. And that will always be something that the trust, um, trust will, 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 will want to do and will have to do. And if they fall short on that there, um, then that is clearly a matter of real concern to all of us. Well, Mr Ian Milne. I got last um, could I ask the Minister uh, to detail the outstanding recommendations which were made following the procurement review of Antrimeria Hospital and a time frame for their completion? Well, we had asked for a course of work to be done. Um, I produced um, a statement to this House um, <coughs> over the course of the, the past few weeks, um, which indicated that uh, there were procurement issues. Um, and whilst there was not evidence of, of fraud, um, there were certainly weaknesses in procurement, and we are looking for those weaknesses um, to be closed off and to have a much more robust procurement scheme in the northern area. Well, Mr. Millen, for supplementary. For my good last one, Colia Rilgus, Awakas Don Era, Aggression. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Can the Minister give us an assurance? Uh, that the, these recommendations will be implemented across the trusts and uh, that the procurement throughout the health service will be open and transparent. Well, it certainly is a case that we want uh, our, our procurement to be um, open and transparent um, throughout the system. So the business services organisation will carry out much of that work for trusts and where trusts are engaged in direct procurement, uh, we will want everything to be done. Um, in a way which ensures that it has public confidence and delivers best value for money um, for the public. Order. Time is up. Order. We must move on to questions to the Minister of the Environment. I call Mr David McNary. Mr McNary. Question one. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I believe that planning can make a very positive contribution to the development of our local economy, and that is why my department gives priority to proposals that have the potential to bring investment to the local economy and create jobs, and ensures that these applications are processed to a decision as quickly as possible. Performance across all categories of applications has improved in recent years. And I know strenuous efforts are being made to continue this improvement. However, I also acknowledge that more can be done, and that is why I announced in January a series of new actions to further improve our performance and planning. These actions include shortening and simplifying planning policy, continuing to implement key reforms such as initiating new development plan work encouraging more pre-application discussions and pre-application community consultations, improved consultee performance, including...